So good morning, everyone. Um, so um, welcome back to uh, QX01, and welcome back to the second part on uh, introduction to quantum cryptography and quantum key distribution, or QKD. So the first part was uh, given by uh, Dr. Jelen Actas from the University of Bristol. And now we have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Chris Irvin, who uh, used to work at the University of Bristol and, and started this company called Kets that he's going to talk about. So just to present uh, Chris briefly, so Chris studied at the University of, of Toronto in Canada. He's a Canadian. Waterloo. Waterloo. Oh, sorry, Waterloo, sorry. <laughs> and then he did his PhD at the University of Waterloo. That's where we met and worked together. And then he moved to uh, the UK, the University of Bristol, where he's been there for quite some time. And as I said recently, he's going to talk about it. He, he uh, started his company working on uh, quantum key distribution. So it's a great pleasure to have you. So please, uh, Chris, uh, the floor and the desk is yours. Merci beaucoup. Um, thanks very much for the chance to talk to you folks. Um, uh, like Christoph says, um, I had the pleasure of meeting your professor. He was my postdoc back at uh, University of Waterloo, and I couldn't help but put in a couple of slides on um, some of the first experiments that he helped me do uh, with, quantum, with the quantum key distribution system back at Waterloo. So I think this should complement your lecture by Jay Lan. Um, he gave you a really good sound, uh, solid base in all the theory that goes along with quantum key distribution, quantum cryptography. Um, this is gonna be a bit more of a experimental flavor. What do some of these things look like when you build them, um, data you get out of them, that kind of thing. Um, so hopefully it complements quite well. So as, oops, wrong screen. So as mentioned, um, I'm now in a company called Kets. And so this is where I am present day, I guess. We're gonna go backwards in time in a second. And at KETS, we're combining the power of quantum technologies. In this case, it's quantum key distribution, it's uh, quantum random number generation, and a few other things to solve some of the most important security challenges on the planet. So I guess you're in a, a quantum uh, information course right now, and you've probably come across Shor's algorithm, which is sort of where it got its claim to fame. The main reason being that um, Shor's algorithm shows that you had a factor very quickly on a quantum computer. And it turns out that when you sort of log into your bank account on your phone, uh, you do a myriad of other things, um, you're relying on factoring being hard, which it turns out a quantum computer is quite good at. Um, so this is where KETS comes in. We sort of fight um, quantum with quantum by using um, quantum key distribution and other, other means to, to secure your data in the, in the future. So that's what we're doing in KETS right now. Uh, and the whole reason for this, if you really step back, is because we want to make this beautiful sort of picture that you see on the screen a reality, because this is, this is the way the world is going into connected cities, uh, connected transport, uh, putting your medical records online. So if you're traveling and you're sick, you can easily access them, all sorts of good stuff. Um, but all of this is predicated on the assumption that you have good security for all this information, so that the information sort of can't be used um, against you sort of thing. And this isn't done. Um, people building these smart cities are just using the sort of the status quo, uh, which tends to be our current cryptography. And it's approaching this cliff edge with uh, quantum computing um, coming on strong with the likes of Google and IBM and, and many others sort of really developing things quite, quite a lot quicker than, than they have in the past. So if we do step back and, oh, sorry, one more. And uh, to show you that there is real jobs out there, not just in academics, but if you want to come work for companies, it's quite hot at the moment, quantum technology. This is us, Kets. We're a team of actually 13. I couldn't find a, a photo of Rob Starkwood, who's just joined us, but uh, we're 13, one more person at the moment, plus some students and consultants based in Bristol, UK. Um, and some of our members have done some of the world's first demos of things on, you're going to see these chip-based systems quite soon. Um, but yeah, just to give you a flavor that there is, um, there is jobs out there in, in sort of the quantum technology market. It's quite hot in, in Europe. So now if we do step back in time, I couldn't help. And I had quite a bit of fun going back through all of these um, slides because I met your professor way back at the University of Waterloo. I don't know whether, hopefully you can see my mouse cursor. The University of Waterloo campus is sort of in this, we call it the Ring Road. Um, and when I started my master's, I got tasked with building an entangled, so these entangled pairs of photons that Jaylan was talking about that have uh, a very high degree of correlation. 
um, that lets two people, if they each get half of a pair, distribute a key because uh, they're highly correlated. So I, I built an entangled source. I'll show you a, a blown up picture in a second, blown up picture. And it was housed in the CEIT building. So on the sixth floor, and then I ran fibers up to the rooftops to these telescope enclosures that again, you'll see a bigger pictures in a second. They look sort of like, like sausage stands um, that you might find outside a, a tennis venue or something. And then they went over, we sent the, the, the pairs, one half went over about a 400 meter link to another building called the BFG building where I had a receiver. And the other one went uh, quite a ways over um, 1.3 kilometers to the Perner Institute, where again, there was a receiver. Um, so, and this is um, <laughs> your professor painstakingly and others helped me collect data at night to build all this equipment. And it was quite a bit of fun because um, it really does have some, when you stop to think about it, wacky features, these correlations, uh, but you can use them to do real tasks like distribute secure keys. So Jaylan mentioned different types of sources, single photon sources, entangled sources. This is an entangled one. It's a little bit busy, but you should be able to pick out the main things he talked about. So there's a pump laser, happens to be at 400 nanometers, um, reflects off a couple of mirrors that just give you sort of some beam steering. There's a lens that focuses it down into a really tight spot because you really want to sort of um, maximize the power at a very tight spot. And then this nonlinear optical crystal, a BBO crystal. Um, and then through type two phase matching, you end up producing sort of pairs on these two cones. And if you pick out the intersection points of, I'm not doing this justice with my fingers, but if you pick out the two intersection points, I think Jay Lan, if you go back to his slides, has a nice picture of this. Then each cone sort of has uh, a pair of photons. And at the overlap, you can't tell whether the pair came from the first cone or the second cone, which when you write out the state becomes an entangled one. And it's entangled in polarization. You get, um, you know you get a horizontal and a vertical polarized photon, one of each, and you're not sure which one comes out on, each, on, uh, on which side. So when you end up writing the state, it's sort of one over root two, the first possibility, which is H on the left, V on the right, plus um, V on the right, uh, sorry, then the reverse of that. So V, H, so V on the left and H on the right. Um, I should have written this down. It might be coming on slides, but if you refer to Jay Land's slides, he lists the Bell states. So we used Psi minus if you want to go back and have a look. So yeah, you collect the photons coming out. They come out at this small little three degree angle. You have some more mirrors and collection optics. Um, and there's a bunch of cleanup optics there to just make things uh, indistinguishable and filters. Um, and eventually you get it into fibers. And now you've got it into a, a fiber system that you can plug into, in my case, telescopes. So this sat on the sixth floor of this building, the EIT building. Uh, oh, and uh, I'll come back to this in a second. Um, and then it, I ran big long fibers, 100 meters or so up to the rooftop, and it was quite a fun master's project because I built everything, well, with the help of a lot of people, um, from entangled sources to telescopes. So this is a, a three inch lens, uh, sort of the simplest telescope you can imagine. A fiber comes in at the focal point and, and the light expands into a three inch lens. It was sort of a lesson in how to build a, a QKD system from Thorlabs parts, really. Um, and electric motors, um, I'll let you adjust the focus and the, the pointing, the fine pointing of this thing. And then the sort of the metal construct allows you to do the, the coarse pointing so that I can sit in this office. If you look down here, I'm pointing at the BFG office out in the distance and I can actually remote in to the computer that controls um, the, this pointing to sort of finally adjust and make sure that the beam comes right into that window and hits my receiver. Um, and we're using free space because there's this nice, you can go over fibers, we just happen to do free space. There's this nice uh, window of transmittance up around 800 and we were about 815 nanometers or so. So you're just into a nice window where you get quite a good transmittance through the atmosphere. On the other side, the receiving side, you basically got the reverse telescope. So again, it's a three inch lens that collimates the light back down and then there's a small little, I think it was like a three millimeter lens if memory serves, um, that collimates it into now a three millimeter beam. Um, again, you can see looking over the top of this telescope pointed back at my little, my little shack up sitting on the EIT rooftop. Um, and so when the light, the light comes in, gets collimated down, there's the lens, I think about right here that puts it into the three millimeter beam and it comes into, this is polarization we were using. Uh, a polarization analyzer, really. So you, there's a filter because there's all sorts of background light out there. We, even though we did the experiments at nighttime, there's still lots of photons hanging around. 
And then it was a passive measurement of the polarization in one of two bases, which is where you get your security from. So the photon could come in and had a 50-50 chance of hitting a beam splitter. And if it got reflected, then there was a polarizing beam splitter that split it up, uh, split the photons up into sort of horizontally polarized photons and vertically polarized photons and collected them into now multi-mode fibers. Or if it got transmitted through, it was a half wave plate that sort of rotated the bases by 45 degrees and analyzed things in, in plus. If it came through, I think it was plus 45, it got reflected as minus 45. So basically you got four fibers out here. And once the photon that came in, hit the beam splitter and then went through this measurement system was split up into one of these four fibers. Essentially it's had its polarization measured, though it was still a light pulse. So the next step is you come into this bank of avalanche photodiodes, which basically can take a single photon and it'll knock an electron in these, that's why it's called an avalanche. It'll knock an electron in the material, which will knock two electrons and you get this avalanche uh, of electrons that ends up being a nice cleaned up into a nice TTL pulse. And so now you've measured and it's now an electronic signal. Um, there's BNC cables that sort of come out the back of this um, bank of detectors and they come into something called a time tagger, a time stamper, because we figure out which, we figure out the photons go with each other by basically they're created at the same point. So once you take care of the differences and distances and electronic delays and stuff, it's basically coincident events. When they arrive at the same time, you, you know that they were from the same pair. And from those, you should be able to get um, the correct key. So that goes into a time tagging event. Uh, and we the last thing we need is a really accurate time base. So this is a little GPS receiver. Uh, and you can see it's sort of mushroom here that would connect up to satellites and give us down sub nanosecond timing. Um, because if you don't have, uh, it was a quartz oscillator in here too, if you don't have two accurate time bases, then you really don't know what one second means in each different location. So all these, all these pieces contribute to a system that, if I go back one, you, pr whoop, you produce photons, you split them up, Alice gets one, Bob gets another, they're in fibers. Then they go up to the rooftop and go over two different telescoping um, um, systems, uh, come into receivers and get analyzed for their polarization. Um, and this was actually uh, the experiment. We were moving out of this building, uh, I think a week after we collected the data. So there's nothing like a hard deadline to get your ass in gear. Um, and so you can see sitting in the BFG building here, um, with all of our equipment set up, um, looking back over this telescope, you can see a red alignment laser. That's how we'd, we'd send a strong alignment laser, turn off the lights, and you, you make sure to, um, with sort of pieces of paper and stuff, get that red light first onto your, the lens of your telescope, and then you plug your fibers first into, there's a power meter sitting here, and you maximize basically the power through your system. By sitting on this computer, um, I could adjust the pointing of this beam to get it to really hit this lens, and then there were some knobs here, um, uh, one here and one on the bottom that would allow me to then match the receiver up to the angle that the, the light was coming in. And you did the same thing over the longer link. Um, this was over 1.3 kilometers sitting in the PI building, again, a duplicate setup, and just kind of neat that um, the, the, the light actually gets clipped in the telescope uh, back up here. Um, which causes some um, interference patterns. So that's what you can actually kind of see that the picture uh, picked up. You can see uh, the fact, uh, interference pattern in the, in the alignment laser that comes. Um, and these things really work over um, real world. This was not at all a lab-based experiment. So I thought it was fun to show this. I hope you folks can see this. Um, Christoph yell if no one's seeing this, but this was the, what the beam looked like over a 400 meter link. Um, the line there is three inches and that's the size of the beam when it came out of the telescope. Um, so we actually over 400 meters were able to focus um, the uh, alignment beam and the um, when we plugged in the actual source, the source beam, um, smaller than three inches, which is a good thing. Um, you can make it sort of tighter. You can get to higher transmission through your entire system when you do all that. Um, and it doesn't wobble around too much. Um, that was pretty good, over 400 meters. And then we called this a feature because we were simulating a high disturbance system, but we went over the physics building's ventilation system um, quite soon after um, exiting the telescope on the way to the Perimeter Institute, this 1.3 kilometer link. 
Uh, and so anybody who studies sort of atmospheric effects, um, different temperatures, different gases and stuff um, cause disturbances in the atmosphere so that your nice beam ends up looking like this, <laughs> where you can't focus it really to three inches anymore. It's a little bit expanded. It bounces all over the place. Um, but again, it's a feature. We were simulating a, a high, um, uh, high loss environments, something akin to satellites and stuff. We'll call it that. Um, but even in this situation, the nice thing about quantum key distribution is the only thing that happens if your beam misses your telescope, if you don't collect those photons, is your key rate goes down. But there's nothing about insecurity because you're always basing the security on the, on the events that you did receive, making sure you received enough of them, and that the statistics back up uh, once you put them through the security proofs, um, the fact that you 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 distilled keys in a secure fashion. No one else uh, knows enough about them um, to crack your system. So I thought that was kind of neat. Um, and uh, and Christoph, uh, thank you. You had a huge part in helping me get uh, this far. Um, and we did this over the course of the night. And the two things Jalen would have mentioned that you track are the quantum bit error rate. So this is the number of errors that end up um, in, in, your, in your measured streams. So these have to be corrected. Um, when it comes to security proofs in the in a simplistic infinite key limit, under 11%, you're secure. And so this was on a two second by two second basis. They all get aggregated together. And then sort of I, I work on the data um, as a whole. So I think it was about 5% error rate in the end of the day. Um, and the other thing you can track is the, is, the, is the rates. So blue is the raw rates of detected um, um, photon pairs um, at the two sites then remember you're, each person is measuring in one of two different bases and you can only get a key when the bases match. So just pure statistics, you match half the time. So basically a raw key rate goes to a sifted key rate, which is half as big. Um, and then if you're, if you're doing error correction, privacy amplification, as good as possible, sort of as optimal as possible, you can operate at the Shannon limit. That's this green line. Uh, sadly, my code, my software code for error correction was not optimal, so I, I worked a little under that. This is this purple line. And that's so the final secret key rate we got out of the system at the end of the day. Um, and you can see some of the statistics for, we tried a couple of different configurations. I could set up a local system where the receivers were right next to the source, and here's what I sort of got out. So 6,000 raw bits a second, raw, measurement, raw coincident events a second, um, and sort of a 3% error rate. And then you start putting in different links. So a single link um, cuts you down by about half. So that the, the transmission efficiency of that single link is about 50% because it's cut out about half your raw events. Um, and some extra background light gets in, which makes your bit error rate go up. Um, I tried two short links um, to see what I got. I tried one long link because um, the engineer in me always only adds sort of one extra complication on any given night, because if I add five, then who knows what went wrong. And then eventually we got up to the, the two links. Um, and it was that second night where I got some really nice results um, in terms of a raw bit error rate of about 565 bits a second, uh, under a 5% bit error rate, uh, and an actual, you're getting about 85 uh, secure bits per second. So you're not video conferencing with this yet. But I mean, I'm in a startup now. That's enough to um, 85 bits a second to send me a nice uh, investment check uh, and, and uh, encrypt it with a one-time pad, something like that. I'll go back a second because I had a second source up here that I think Jaylan also talked to you about. So this was my type two entangled photon source. It works perfectly well, just the rates are quite low. I think I got locally 100,000 pairs a second. And then you start throwing in all the losses of the system and you're down to um, the couple hundred that I showed. Um, there's other ways of doing it. One's a Sagnac loop. Um, so again, it's a strong pump laser, 404. Um, some dichroic mirrors, because there was a bit of um, IR in it that I had to clean up. It goes off a couple of mirrors through a couple of wave plates to sort of set the polarization that you want. And then there's a focusing lens, just like before because you're gonna focus this laser down into a nonlinear optical crystal, but this time um, this time, everything's gonna be collinear. Before the pairs were produced at sort of angles to each other and you, and you collected them. Now you're actually gonna focus the laser and it's gonna come down and hit a dual wavelength. So it can handle 404, it can handle 808, polarizing beam splitter, and half the light will go one way, half the light will go the other way, all in a collinear sort of beam-like fashion. And if it goes one way around the loop, then there's a, a PPKTP crystal in here. 
that has a chance of um, splitting a blue photon into two IR photons, again, H and V. Um, but if it goes the other way around the loop, same thing happens. Um, and if, but if you do the math, when those two possibilities recombine at this dual wavelength PBS, you again end up with that same polarization entangled state. And so one half of it goes through this output port and gets again collected with some optics, some, some filtering in, in, in front before it goes into a fiber. The other way, it bounces up to a dichroic mirror. So dichroic meaning it lets blue light through, but it bounces off the, the IR or the red light and again gets coupled into Alice. So why would you do this? Well, the, the, because it's collinear, all the sort of mode matching and stuff is much, much nicer. So you end up getting, uh, I don't know whether I copied in my table comparing the two sources, but it's like an order or of magnitude or two brighter. You get millions of um, photon pairs a second. Because I think here I put 50 milliwatts of light through and I'd max out about 100,000 um, pairs a second. I think here I couldn't go much more than five milliwatts. So that's an order of magnitude less. And I'd be up in a couple hundred thousands uh, pairs. Uh, and that's the point where our detectors and stuff would max out. So much, much brighter source. And I think JLAN had this very nice table, if you'll remember, of different sources and getting the brightness up. Because if you want to use this in the real world, you obviously want the highest key rates possible. All right. How are we doing for time? Mm, 20 minutes or so. All right. Not too bad. Mm -mm. I sort of threw this in, um, mostly because, uh, well, Christoph might find it fun to look at what we tried after his time at uh, Waterloo. Um, it was sort of the natural follow on, because um, besides quantum key distribution, there's lots of other cryptographic tasks you can try and do. You can, you can try and do coin flipping, you can try and do oblivious transfer, or you can start doing using entangled states that are more than two photons. So you can, this one, use three. Um, and we violated an inequality that showed that, again, that quantum is non-local. So just like your Bell's inequality you've, you've heard of, there's an equivalent one called Merman's inequality um, that if you violate, you can show that it's not just sort of pairwise non-local, but it goes into no matter how many um, particles you add to the state. And we were actually after, I, I think, a Svetlitsky inequality that even bounds you even, even tighter, but um, losses uh, meant we had to sort of relax it to a Merman inequality. So it's, we're, we're doing something like a Bell inequality to show the non-locality of um, quantum. But what you can also do with a three photon entangled state is secret sharing. So it's a fun, you can look up the original papers. They're not too bad to wrap your head around. You can distribute uh, sort of like a third of an entangled state to three parties. They can all make measurements. And now you sort of get part of a key where you can again sort of um, encrypt information um, all together. And the only way to crack the system is now partners have to collude. So you can sort of imagine maybe, I don't know, your, your Bitcoin um, private key, um, sending it to, I don't know, 10 different banks um, to, to keep a piece of the key because um, you want a backup because you lose that Bitcoin key, you lose your money. Um, so the secret sharing would work by you sort of put a little bit of the key into 10 different banks. And then you can recombine it because you ask for those bits back from each of the banks. Um, but the banks can't get at it unless they all collude. Um, so this, this system, I guess, that I'm going to show can be used to do other cryptographic tasks uh, and was kind of just um, the natural extension to that uh, QKD experiment. So we're going to distribute a three photon entangled state now. Uh, again, we like to do these things in the field, in the real world. So we have uh, the source sitting on the ground floor of a new building we were at at the time, producing the states. And then fibers again running up big long shafts to, you can just see the telescope dome up here where there's two telescopes. And then we have Bob over here in the distance. And we have now a Charlie over here in the distance uh, over this lovely winter swept scape because why would we try and do this in the summer when it's nice and comfortable we did this all of course in minus 20 degree weather um, in the canadian winter um, so you can see the experimental setup a little bit uh it's 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 like um jlan's um type two source only you do two of them uh actually sorry and actually it's a type one source um you do two sources um back to back so there's a strong blue light that comes in you split up two pairs, you split up and it keeps going and it splits up two more pairs. And if you interfere half of each uh, pair on a beam splitter, what you can end up at the end of the day, post-selected. So on the occasions where you get 
um, a timestamp in this heralding arm, and then you detect things in the Alice arm, the Bob arm, the Charlie arm. So post selected, um, you get an entangled state. You get the state that's on this slide, and you can sort of tweak with some wave plates what the phase is going to be between this state. So we kept one state locally um, where Alice measured, and instead what we did was piped in her random ch choice, because this is all about violating a bell inequality. So you need all these space-like separated cones to match up so that no one party can influence any other party. Everything's space-like separated. And so you can cheat a little bit and cut out one free space optical link and instead make it an, an RF link. So we, we measure one Alice's photons locally down in the lab on this building and pipe in a random choice. So we built three quantum random number generators and it sat in a trailer out here and piped in over an RF link. And then there's two telescope links over about 800 meters or so, one going off to Bob uh, and the other off to, to Charlie at an angle. Um, and again, then it's a very similar, well, you're going to see it, I think, in a second. It's a reasonably similar um, receiver, only now it has to be an active basis choice. So before, there's nothing wrong with this in a QKD system. It was passive, sort of the photon, whoops, where have we gone? The photon, when it comes in, it sort of makes the passive choice of which um, uh, measurement basis it's going to get measured in. If it goes one way, it's going to measure in H and B, zero and one. If it goes another way, it's going to be measured in plus and minus, which is plus and minus 45 degrees uh, or the um, uh, yeah, plus and minus basis. Um, you can't do that when you're trying to violate an inequality. You need an active basis choice. So the difference with our receiver now is it's just a polarizing beam splitter and two detectors and out front is a pockel cell. So what that is, you apply voltage and you can rotate uh, whatever sort of, uh, well, you can rotate a certain um, angle. So a uh, random number generator, uh, random number from our random number generator comes in, it's a zero, you rotate by zero degrees and you, you analyze an H and V. Um, if it comes in as a one, you rotate, well, if you're doing QKD, you rotate by 45. Um, and then you'd be in the uh, plus minus basis, but for the actual uh, inequality, we're somewhere in between to measure the inequality. Right, so this is what, again, it looked like we had to work out all these angles to make sure that things were gonna be space-like separated. Um, we, of course, worked in the dead of winter just to give ourselves some fun. Um, these are the kinds of experiments and systems you can get involved in, and it really is the real world and all sorts of problem solving that has nothing to do with quantum because we got not one car stuck, not two cars stuck, but oh, there was a third one I had a picture of as well. So just uh, getting cars unstuck was, was interesting. Like I said, there was this nice dome up top um, that opened up and you can just barely see sort of two telescopes that were the same telescopes from the QKD system. Um, you can see our RF trailer sitting out here with a nice RF antenna pointed back at the building. Um, and then you can see our two trailers where uh, we also had sort of antennas because we'd set up a, we set up a, a network because we'd exchange data live um, to do the measurements. Um, and it was it was a lot of data live. Um, and then in you can see, I think, in the top one, there's a window in these trailers. And that's where we'd have now in the bottom one, you can just make out sort of the similar uh, metal scaffolding and then there's a receiver sitting on top of uh, that scaffolding. If I don't have a picture, I'll bring up this talk and show you better what the what the receiver looks like. But I don't think I have it. That's a shame. Um, I might try that in two seconds. So then um, you make measurements. There's Alice, Bob and Charlie. I got to wrote, write this fabulous piece of software that probably means nothing to you folks. The thing, so there's all sorts of correlations you're measuring, two and three full correlations that go into expectation values. So the, these are the, the, down here is there's eight expectation values that go into that inequality. When you go way back here, there is, well, there's four that go into the inequality and you measure the other four as well, just for the hell of it. Um, that's what you're measuring. And all of those then go into a Merman parameter, which is this M0, I'm not very, um, flamboyant when I name things. And then there's sort of the opposite uh, Merman parameter. And it's plotted sort of over time periods on blue is, is, the, is the one we were measuring. And I guess the whole point at the end of the day is if, it, if you're getting values over two, then quantum mechanics is non-local. Um, and you can sort of see this is a cumulative statistic. We got up to 2.79, um, a bit cleaner here. You can sort of see these four expectation values we're measuring. And over the course of only an hour and a half, um, we were doing 64 different measurements 
we got a value of 2.77, um, which was, uh, I'm being cut off here, but uh, a couple of orders of my um, sigmas uh, violation. And actually, uh, am I gonna switch to it? Let's try and do this live. This could work out horribly. Uh, mm, 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 Cause it's worth seeing what this receiver looks like. And it's nice to see, at least I've always liked to see what these things look like when they are built. So two seconds. Uh, 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 I think it was in here somewhere. Uh, there we go. Mm -hmm. There. Um, so this was aligning the Paco cell. There was all sorts of finicky little things you had to do to get it aligned. And we had some ringing and all sorts of uh, stuff. But this was inside the receiver. So it was a beefed up version of the QKD. This was now a six inch lens that weighed a ton, uh, sat on a massive breadboard um, to collect more light because we were going over longer, um, uh, longer distances. Um, but otherwise it looks pretty much the same. We come in, um, there's, there's some sort of local um, things that we use to align the system. If we wanted to flip up a mirror here, then we could locally align with a red laser, the rest of the system. And then you flip it down and the light would come in from the lens. And again, it's uh, it's um, half and quarter wave plates plus this Paco cell in here, this RTP cell that lets you sort of actively, cause it's very high power, like thousands of volts that you'd apply to this thing. So I was always worried for my life when I was playing with it. Um, would let you rotate zero and 45 or whatever um, angle you needed before going into that normal sort of basis measurement at the back with a half wave plate and a PBS and some and some couplers into fibers then. Uh, do I have anything else interesting here? Uh, I think that was mostly it. Uh, uh, uh. That was mostly it. All right, back to this one. So all this is well and good. Um, you could do real things in the real world. Um, we even looked at setting up a little startup called uh, QSpin, I think at the time. And it quickly became apparent that no one was gonna pay much money for something that could be misaligned when someone sneezed. So that's sort of why I um, looked around for who was doing this stuff in an integrated fashion in Bristol was pioneering some of this stuff. So I'll check the time again. Yeah, we're about half an hour in. Um, so this is sort of the second half. I came to Bristol and um, combined forces with Phil Sibson, who was a PhD student, and a few others to do chip-based QKD. Um, so similar concepts. You've got a, a transmitter chip up on the top left here. It's made out of a material called indium phosphide, which means that it's an active 3.5 material. All that means is you can pattern a laser on it. Because um, we're now going to do, before it was entangled, BBM92 QKD. Now we're going to go back to just straight BB84 or cow or differential phase shift. So it's going to be a, a prepare and send. It's going to be a laser that's attenuated to the single photon level rather than entangled photon pairs. Um, so yeah, so it's an indium phosphide active material. You can pattern a laser on it. And then there's four high speed modulators on it. You put, um, you, you, you know, it's called a max ender. So you put a beam splitter, um, on either end uh, where light comes into one path, there's two ports coming in, two ports coming out. And then there's a, a high speed uh, electro-optic modulator in between that can assign a phase. And so that phase basically can do the same manipulations in, in a time bin encoding, which you're gonna see in a second, which we were doing uh, in polarization back with the, um, the bulk system that I just showed you. So you get four high speed modulators to do this four operations you need to make your QKD system secure. You need to do pulse uh, uh, modulation to go from uh, to go from pulses because this is just a continuous uh, wave laser. So you carve it up into pulses. Um, and there's we did this in a particular order. Um, I'll skip to the intensity modulation, which is in the, in the, in the third one. So you, you modulate this down so that most of the light get dumped out of this top port and you're down to the single photon level with what stays in your system. And then the other things you need to do is phase randomization. So between every um, qubit, you're gonna randomize the global phase so that there's no extra information that leaks from your system. And then you do finally the encoding. So is it gonna be a zero, a one, a plus and a minus? That's what this last modulator does. And it was actually, this was um, designed as a transceiver. You could use it as a receiver as well. 
Um, but the losses were a little bit too high in this chip. So we quickly found another chip. And, and so I was going to say the size reference. This is a six millimeter by three, two millimeter chip. So it's like a fifth the size of your pinky fingernail, which sort of immediately brings home why you do these things on a chip thing rather than the massive systems I was showing before. It's much more easily integrated and much cheaper, that kind of thing. Um, so we quickly designed a receiver chip, um, slightly different material, silicon oxynitride. Um, basically the features are a little bit bigger, the losses are quite a bit lower. Um, and so light comes in, uh, it gets split up first with a, again, this mock sender uh, acts like a beam splitter. So the lower rail is analyzing early and late. You're gonna see sort of this time bit encoding in a second. And then if it goes into the top rail, um, we analyze the phase between an early and a late, um, which is like your, your X, X, X measurement. And the bottom is like your Z measurement. So JLAN showed you last time how you can do this with polarization and Alice picks some random bits, a random basis and says uh, polarization, HV, or sorry, VH minus 45, plus 45, that kind of thing. Bob picks a random basis and gets a measurement. Anytime they match, you end up with a shared to keep it. You don't have to use polarization as your degree of freedom to store your zero and one. And in fact, in chips, that's not what you want to do. We use, uh, it's called a time bin encoding. So now your qubit is going to be zero if it's early or one if it's late. And your, um, your, comp your uh, I need to finish my coffee. Your second basis is plus and minus where you're going to spread this photon across early and late and put a zero or a pi phase shift. That gets you your second basis, your plus and your minus. And uh, you, you use this because it works very well in chips. It works very well in fibers because fibers and chips have all sorts of polarization effects that monkey with your, your qubits otherwise. And so we can create these states on a chip and how you analyze them is an asymmetric max ender where you have this long arm and a max ender. So what happens? Well, if we put in an early one, so that's a zero, it gets split up. The sort of the two, the interference misses itself and you end up with three receiving sort of measurement time bins. And for the zero and one, you look at the first and the third time bin and you ignore the middle time bin. So in the first and the third time bin here, it showed up early and nothing showed up late. If you then go to a late photon, again, they sort of, the two pulses miss each other. There's no interference here. So we're gonna ignore the middle guy and nothing shows up early, everything shows up late. So you can, you can measure and you can create and you can measure early and late pulses. But you need a second basis for security in QKD. And so what happens there? Well, we put the photon distributed across the two early and late time bins and a phase across them. So if you have a zero phase, then what you're gonna see is that the pulses get split up and there's a part of them that recombine on this beam splitter. And depending on that phase, it's either gonna come out in this middle time bin or this middle time bin. So if we run it through, this is the zero phase, these two pulses interfere. And now we're looking at the middle time bin. So because it was a plus, it showed up up here and now we're neglecting the sort of one and three. And then vice versa, if we show with a minor, with a pi phase shift, again, you're gonna get, you're gonna get some interference here. And now everything goes straight through. And when I say neglecting, only one thing, only one thing clicks in your detector. So really what we're doing is, is this is the click we're, we're measuring versus the other stuff ends up being um, opposite bases, right? Alice sends one basis, we measure in the wrong basis and we toss those away in sifting. Um, so this is what we're doing in theory. And then in practice, you can sort of see what we did. We can create, um, this is a histogram of our light pulses an early and a late or you can't see the phase, uh, at least in the creation step, you can spread it across the two time bins. And then you can look at the two arms and measuring. So again, for zero and one, you're ignoring the middle time bin. And so it's early, then in arm, oops, back one more. So we'll call this arm one, arm two, um, you get early. And if you send it late, you get late. And if you put a phase in here, then you get uh, in the middle and nothing here and vice versa, and just superimposing them. So there's nothing magical about this, it's just a different, um, a different degree of freedom that we use, because this is nice and stable in, in a fiber. Um, the timing of arrival doesn't get monkeyed with much when you go into a fiber. Um, some other bits, so 
I was sort of showing how you measure this with a bulk system, but we measure it with a, a, a chip system. And why do you do that? Well, we did some early measurements with a bulk system uh, and our transmitter, and you can sort of see that visibility is sort of equivalent to your error rate. So one is like no errors, and your high visibility zero is like everything's an error. Um, so with no feedback, you last what? You're lucky if you last half an hour before everything goes haywire. Uh, and even with some active feedback, you're still working hard um, to get things stable enough that you might get keys out of your system. Versus if you put it in a receiver chip, um, and just leave it on its own with some temperature drift, then already it's not too bad. And then you put a minimum sort of Peltier cooler underneath it to keep it at a constant temperature and it's just, it's bang on one. So this is again, why you go to chip-based systems. The stability is much, much better. What are you doing timing wise? Uh, not too bad. Okay. So we can actually do four different protocols with that chip. We could do BB84, which is basically what I've just shown you. There's an early, there's a late, they're spreading your phase uh, with a plus, spreading your phase with a pi and a minus. And then we always leave a blank um, time bin afterwards just to sort of separate qubits. Um, and so you can send those four states in a, in a BB84. And typically what you get is a key rate um, uh, plot where raw is sort of the raw number of signals coming. And now it's a log plot. Um, and we emulated some different fiber distances by sort of increasing the loss between the sender and receiver. Um, and then green is the actual secret key rates that you get out once you do error correction, excuse me, privacy amplification. Um, and then red is the quantum bit error rate. It was down about a uh, percent or so, but eventually you get so much loss in your system. This is the case with all QKD systems that background light takes over your error rate skyrockets and your key rate plummets because you've, you've got to be as pessimistic as possible and ascribe all the errors to an eavesdropper. When they get too high, you, you've got to assume that they've gotten too much information. And so this is the BB84 example. You can sort of see that uh, there's a couple of different um, numbers up here. So our mu was sort of our, our number of photons per pulse. So roughly a, roughly a half a photon per pulse. That's what got us down to roughly on order of, of a single photon per pulse. State rate is sort of how fast we're trying to create pulses. So there's a stream of pulses coming out one every half giga, gigahertz. Giga, um, yeah, uh, half a gigahertz rep rate. Um, so whatever that translate into one every, I can't do that number in my head, um, every time period, 270 nanoseconds I have stuck in my head, that's probably wrong. You can work it out as an exercise to the student. That's our state rate though, is we're doing about 560 megahertz versus uh, single photons uh, in a second. And then you look at the, the quantum bit error rates in the, in the uh, Z basis, in the uh, X basis, um, and you get about a percent in both. All of those add up into your error correction, your privacy amplification, um, and going into your state rate, plus all the losses of your system to get your final secret key rate of about 345 kilobits per second. So that's much higher than what I had over the free space link, right? I was down at 80, 80 bits per second. So another reason why you go to integrated systems, you can get rid of uh, lots of losses if you go to fiber and do a few different things. We can do the other two um, protocols that Jalen mentioned. So here at one way is putting a zero and one through and then decoy pulses. And you're measuring security from interfering sort of real states with the decoy states. And you get a, effectively a cube error out of that as well. The same raw error rates and the same secret key rate plots that you get out of that. So not too much difference than BB84. And you can look at all the stats there. So we, we, we tune the parameters to get the highest key rates. So it's a little bit less in terms of the amount of uh, uh, single photons per pulse. Uh, we get to clock it a bit higher though. Uh, so almost a gigahertz. Qbear doesn't change very much. And we get about the same secret key rate out. And the last one is, is differential phase shift where you just get a steady stream of pulses. And it is the phase between each one that sets up. It's the zero phase, it's a zero because uh, the qubit is sort of spread out over two pulses uh, and overlapping. That's what made sort of the security proofs for DP, DPS really tough because you can't really separate the qubit here. Here are you, this is a clearly delineated zero. This is a one here. These two pulses are your are your zero, but also this half that like and this 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 pulse here is shared with this qubit, but is also shared with the next qubit, which made security proofs difficult. Um, but again, it's the phase that gives you your zeros and ones. It's the interference that gives you a cube error for security, and you get a very similar plot for raw key rates and for secret key rates. Uh, and you can look at the numbers up here again. We sort of. Same amount of uh, photons per pulse, about a quarter uh, of a photon in each pulse, but we get to clock it now up to almost two gigahertz. 
Um, there's only one interference you're looking for for security here, again, still around a percent. Uh, and we end up at the end of the day actually with a slightly higher key rate. These are all over um, 20 kilometers of fiber. That's common. That's what you commonly uh, hear for a number. Almost done, uh, I promise. Um, probably another 10, 15 minutes. So other reasons you go to a chip-based approach. Well, as soon as you've got a single transmitter and a single receiver, it's really not so far off your computer because um, these are all computer CAD designs going control C, control V, or Apple C, Apple V if you're on a Mac and starting to pattern these things next to each other so that you have on one chip, not one transmitter, but you have two, you have four, you have 10. This is also how you can get the rates up. So it's exactly what we did. We took two independent transmitters um, in Indian FOS5. And then because you could tune their wavelength, the wavelength of this laser, you could tune in two ways. You could heat the chip and you could get about a nanometer swing by heating by a couple of degrees. And this laser, there's three prongs here. There's a, um, you can apply a voltage to the active medium in the middle one. There's distributed Bragg mirrors on either end that if you apply a voltage to, you can also sort of just tune the cavity a little bit and get about an eight nanometer, eight to nine nanometer swing. So you get about 10 nanometers that you can play with. And so what we do is we tune the two chips so that they're separated by um, standard telecoms um, channel spacings. And actually we did it by two just to decrease the noise. Um, all the signals come in into a poor person's um, wavelength division multiplexing, which is just a, a beam splitter. So we cut out half our rates, but it was it is a WDM that lets you combine the two signals goes over a, a channel and then comes into a receiver because way well back here whoops i showed you a receiver and actually that was only half the chip we designed this thing to be uh two re two receivers so um there's one on the top one on the bottom and there's a, a wavelength of d multiplexing element out front the other thing we did is we offset things in time because you you have two channels there are different wavelengths they're going to get split according to the demultiplexer, but you'll still get sort of some in, in one end and the other end. It's, um, you can sort of see the overlap. I don't know why we turned this on its side, uh, but if you looked at the two next channels, you'd have a tail of the blue going into the green, uh, which would give you just a little bit of this blue air into your green. So instead we used the blue and the red channels and, and ignored the green channel. That's how we, we spaced things. And I mean, the results are not at all surprising. You have uh, turn on the top one and you get a cube error of 2% and a key rate of 300 kilobits per second. You turn on the bottom one and you get 1.8 and 800 and you turn them all on together and you basically add these two numbers and that's your total key rate. Um, so it's, I mean, the results aren't at all surprising but it is a very simple way of getting your, your rates up. Or also you start, I mean, everything works in a network fashion now. Um, early QKD systems were very much point to point. So that's, you won't remember this, but I do, and Christoph will. Back in the early nineties, you, you would connect, the, the internet didn't exist. You'd connect to a bulletin board system. So you would get to one-on-one -on -one connect to a computer sat somewhere that would have resources. I don't know, you go and play some games and stuff, but it was a one-to-one -one connection. And that's not how the internet works anymore. It's many-to-many -many connections, it's networked. Um, so the other reason this is interesting is you can now have banks of transmitters and receivers and um, so that user can connect into 10 different receivers. Now you've got a networked device. This is also why this gets quite interesting. Um, we, so this was all done in indium phosphide and silicon oxynitride. They are um, CMOS compatible materials, but they're not silicon, which is what everything is made from. So we then, as a next experiment, um, made some silicon devices. So again, we did, well, we did cow coherent one way and we did BB-84 both in polarization because if you combine um, your, your rails and your chip on a 2D grading coupler, then actually what ends up happening is the top is a zero um, in, in path. It's, it's now we're working with, um, you can also work with the path on a chip. Top path is a zero, bottom path is a one. But if you combine these as a 2D grading coupler, it just magically out pops uh, now a polarization qubit. Um, or you can keep it all in time bin um, and just combine things so that you get a time bin qubit out. Um, going to silicon, it, none of this is obvious. So like all of these materials were meant to ferry electrons around. They can ferry light around. And generally the telecoms industry at classical light levels can get around 99% of their problems by cranking up the power. We can't do that in quantum. So we, this circuit, even though it looks simple, is a nifty little circuit that lets you do QKD by basically biasing your transmitter 
on the top of the block sphere. I think you've probably gone through the block sphere in your, in your quantum info course. So you could go from zero and try, and you'd have to do a two, be able to get up to a, what, a three pi over two phase shift to be able to hit from zero to minus to one to plus. The trouble with these modulators were carrier depletion modulators. And the, well, one of the many troubles with them is they had phase dependent loss. So the more phase you put on this thing, the more loss in the system. And the whole point of a QKD system is that all of your states should come out looking indistinguishable. Even worse, you could hit maybe pi if you were lucky. So you could get from zero to one and never be able to hit the plus state. So this circuit, basically what we came up with is if you bias things up top of the block sphere in the y direction, then now you only need a 90 degree rotation to hit any of your four states for, for QKD. And you're doing exactly the same amount of phase for each of them. So the loss also balances out. Um, so that was this neat little circuit. And you do the usual QKD experiments where you clock it at a certain rate. So for cow, we're still up about two gigahertz and you measure your cube air and you get a final key rate out of that. And I think for this experiment, we put it into a chip-based receiver, the silicon oxynitride receiver I showed again. We then did BB84 and converted to polarization. So it was a bulk optic sort of polarization receiver. And you get again, the, the, the usual stuff that you measure, sort of you clock it at a gig, you get about a 1% error rate and 33 megabits, well, almost a megabit per second in, in key rate. Um, and then we kept it in time bin where we used again, um, a second, second silicon chip. The losses were quite high. So all we measured with it was the bit error rate. We didn't bother to sort of do a full key distribution with it. All right, we're almost done. Um, I'm gonna do this one really quickly because it actually wasn't my work, but you can read about another person that Katz did a, a, a random number generator. You work now with continuous variables, which again, probably came up. I think I saw it in JLAN's notes where you're now measuring the quadratures of the EM field. So really, really briefly, you can do a quantum random number generator, sort of like the ones we did it differently. It was a photon on a beam splitter going left to right, which was our zeros and ones for the Merman inequality experiment. But you can get much higher rates if you use continuous variables. So you shine a strong laser in, vacuum comes in the other port and it goes on a beam splitter. And then if you make a homodyne measurement, so you measure the voltages out of two classical detectors, uh, well, sorry, they're the same detectors telecoms use um, and measure the difference in voltages. It's a homodyne measurement. You get a certain sort of spread in those voltages. You, you estimate what is classical noise and get rid of it. Uh, and then you end up with just quantum noise from the vacuum. It's like you're doing a position or a momentum measurement. So it's now an analog measurement. You bin it up. Uh, it has a certain distribution. You put it through a hash function that sort of flattens everything to a constant distribution. And that's a long-winded way of saying that it's a continuous measurement. So for every sort of snapshot you take with your analog to digital converter, you can get a lot more randomness compared to sort of the, 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 the photon on a beam splitter QRNGs that we use for the Merman inequality. We can get up to over a gigabits per second. A room temperature operation also took good stuff. Sorry, that was brief. It uh, wasn't QKD, but it was kind of a nice to, diversion. And you can see the reference here if you want to go read up on that. Last thing, last thing I promise, and then a little bit about cats is um, one of the, there is something called quantum hacking because um, the system, um, the, the, the theory is secure, but if you build things um, poorly, or if you're specifically in this example, if your detectors are non-ideal, uh, and this is sort of how people have attacked QKD systems and hacked them, they sent in bright light states, uh, like strong lasers to manipulate them. They've manipulated the timing of arrival of photons um, that can hack systems. Detectors basically are, are, are Achilles heel. They don't operate like single photon detectors. They operate like the approximation that can open up your system to, to hacks. So one way around this, luckily, is someone came up with something called measurement device independent QKD. Basically you hand your detectors to a third party, Charlie, and Alice and Bob have two trans, each have a transmitter and send BB84 states, and they just have to get interfered. It's a bell state measurement, which is the equivalent of a, of a beam splitter, basically. They get interfered by beam splitter. Charlie, who could be your adversary, or it could be Eve, your, your adversary measures it and announces the measurements. And remember, Alice and Bob are picking a basis and a bit value, and they're keeping one of those secret. And because they keep one of those secret, they have an advantage over this adversary announcing the measurements that allows them to distribute a key, just everything sort of collapses and looks like BB-84. Um, but now you've given your, your detectors to your eavesdropper and you don't have to worry about them anymore. 
still some still hard to do this. So this is now a different student, Henry of mine, that's got all this to work. You've got to overlap two independent chips um, and their photons on, and do something called a Hong U Mandel interference to show that overlap. So you can see we sort of artificially separated the, the spectrum of the two lasers. It really, this is again, why you go to chips because it's just so um, stable and repeatable when you manufacture these things, you can see the spectrums even have the same little kink there. So you overlap these two things, these two um, chips, you attenuate them to the single photon level and you do a Hong U Mandel. I think I saw some, uh, some of these in, in Jay Lan's notes, interference experiment to show that you're interfering. Basically the two photons are arriving, this beam splitter, they're interfering with each other. They're doing a Bell state measurement uh, when you're at the bottom of this dip, when you've sort of arranged the photons because of timing and stretching the fibers and polarization and stuff to, to arrive here and, and get measured together. Now they are weak coherent sources. So it's attenuated laser, which means you can't get all the way down to zero. This was definitely in Jay Land's slides. If this were true single photons, this dip would go down to zero. They're not, they're weak coherent pulses. And the max you can see is, uh, is ability, visibility down to sort of 50%. But um, it doesn't affect security. People still sh shown that you can get secure key um, with weak coherent states. You still got to do, I, I didn't mention it, but you do something called decoy states where you monkey with the, um, you monkey with the, the light levels, sort of one time you put in a tenth of a photon out, the next time you put a, a four tenths of a photon out into your pulse. Um, and Alice and Bob can then, from their results, um, check whether anybody's listening in, because someone listening in doesn't know what light level has come through. And they, they've, got to, they've got to measure the states or do something to the states, and the statistics get changed differently. Uh, for each light level, depending on what the adversary does. So that's sort of a very hand wavy explanation of what decoy states does. You do the same thing in MDI QPD, which is why it stays secure. Right, so we did first the Hong U Mandel interference experiment. You can see our clock rate is up uh, half a gigahertz or so, and we got pretty close to the 50%. Then the very last thing Henry did is you actually do the whole sort of um, uh, operation of QKD, where now we clocked the two transmitters at two gigahertz, your, your X basis, which was at 30% as a bit error rate, but you're limited to 25% again, because they're weak coherent states, it's sort of the equivalent of this 50% visibility as opposed to going all the way to hundred. But in your Z basis, um, you're early and late, you still got a very low error rate. And this is where you're gonna get your key from. And you plot again, sort of key rate uh, as a function of distance over different fiber lengths, um, and get about 12 kilobits per second over 25 kilometers of fiber. So it's quite a bit less than way back here. If we go back uh, over 20 kilometers of fiber, we were up in the 300 kilobits per second. So we've gone down by an order of magnitude because there's much higher losses now um, getting all of this to work. But in this experiment, you don't have to worry about any detector hacks. That sort of is given for free that um, you're secure against any detector attacks. Oh, sorry, I lied. There's one more thing we did at Bristol. I mean, the whole point is to use this in, in the real world. So we worked with the high performance networking group and it's a bit of a busy diagram, but basically we installed um, different users. We had four different sites. So there was a site agent that had a bunch, a bunch of different kits where it had some, uh, uh, a computer running a bunch of software and a site agent sort of pay, paying attention to the keys being generated with the other three users. It had its own ID, uh, it was an ID Quantique um, QKD system in this case. Um, and then sitting in the middle sort of of that network was a massive optical switch that could basically connect up any user to any user and a software that was sort of a network manager. Um, and then you'd have other users. So in this case, here's your Alice down here and sort of this whole block. And this is your Bob up here. So in this, you can go up to any of the four um, sites and a user shows up and says, okay, I want to talk to this site over here. Um, that would go sort of into your site agent, which would then communicate with the network manager and it, was, and it had a view of the network and would then um, um, connect up all the optical connections, up all the optical connections you needed so that two QKD systems could talk. Uh, and it went through a pathfinding algorithm because this is a hard problem to figure out what's the best way in a complicated network to connect up. And then this would report back to these uh, site agents uh, of the user A and user B saying, okay, you've got your connection. They could spin up their QKD boxes, start exchanging key over the network. Um, and then once they got enough key out of that, um, they could encrypt their data back here and just go over a classical network. So we really did this in a, in a couple of different settings. Um, and software-defined networking is this new 
new paradigm for how telecoms operators are working. And this fits very well in it. Um, so again, there's a reference down here. Some of these is, is going by quite quickly. I appreciate uh, you can go and read a bit more. So now we're almost done. We've been going for an hour. Um, uh, just a little bit about cats. So we've taken literally PhD experiments that were hung together by sort of um, cellophane tape, uh, that kind of stuff, uh, duct tape, um, and now have beautiful chips sitting on nice substrates um, that are going into development kits that users in the real world can actually play with. Because if you come to the very original experiments, which you can't see in this picture by design, whoops, we're going to go back for a sec. Uh, what you can't see, you just see the beautiful chip. But if you saw the full experiment, it's a beautiful chip with fibers hanging off of it, with all sorts of wires going everywhere, with complicated amplifier sort of networks next to it, and then a stack of, I don't know, 100,000 pounds worth of pulse pattern generators and everything else you need to drive a system. Um, and, and a big sign that says, please don't sneeze and misalign this. That's a far cry from what industry needs. So now we've packaged this up. This is what we spent the last two years in KETS doing. Um, that little bit of engineering in quotes, which drives my team nuts because it's a lot of engineering and very hard of putting these things down onto PCBs, putting all that electronics that was generic pulse pattern generators and that kind of thing into purpose built electronics and getting it into basically a PCIe form factor. And we have two bits. We have random number generators and quantum key distribution. And the random number generators have been um, working in a PCIe form factor for a while now, almost a year. We're almost there for QKD. Um, and sort of what's the things we're looking for and doing right now is we're basically testing them out in the real world. So three tests, I'll show you a bit of a zoom in in a second. We flew it on a drone with Airbus, um, which is a bit simple because it's it's just a, a hobbyist, well, a souped up hobbyist drone to start with, but it's a precursor to exchanging keys with satellites and getting sort of global coverage. We put these things in networks with, with British Telecom um, with uh, in partnership with the Quantum Communications Hub here in the UK. Um, and we were on an innovation program with Talus where we partnered with a post-quantum encryption startup. Because if you get into this field, there's different tools you can bring to bear. You can bring quantum hardware like QRNGs, like QKD. Um, or you can also go to updated algorithms called post-quantum algorithms that are conjectured. Uh, they're new. There are different algorithms compared to, um, you saw RSA, you saw Diffie-Hellman. They're, they're different algorithms, work on different math where the conjecture at least is it's hard for a quantum computer. Um, and so in this case, we combine a random number generator with this algorithm to do something. So let me zoom in just real quick. Yeah, these were the three partnerships, sorry. Um, for this Kudos project, we this is the first time we shrunk our little transmitter onto a, like something with credit card size, and then that plugged into sort of a driving board. And all this sat on the bottom of a UAV, uh, on a UAV, a drone. And they had this nice optical system they developed with partners at Oxford and other places um, where we could then pipe in with our fiber optic cable into their optical system that they were using at the time for classical comms. We could then send our quantum channel over it. Um, and basically we had something like a, a, a two kilogram weight limit and we got our transmitter down to 750 grams uh, powers that the UAV that could support um, doing the same clock rates you've seen. Um, and got, we tested over a kilometer, a little bit more. So this is, this is sort of the evolution of my early experiments over a kilometer. Now it's flying on a drone, uh, which is kind of cool to reflect on. And we got um, key rates out, sort of six kilobits per second over quite a high channel loss. Uh, and we're able to do it in the day. All my experiments back in the day were, were at the dead of night that I'd babysit experiments. Um, then we're in this Aquasec project to get our fibers out into deployed, or sorry, our systems out into deployed fibers and systems, two of which that are kind of interesting. Building on that drone, we, we work with tether drone systems. They put up a drone that has a power tether and fiber. So you can think of, I don't know, disaster or uh, military or sort of resource gathering situations where you want to put up uh, a sort of a quantum bridge, a uh, portable quantum bridge. You fly this drone and you fly a couple of them and suddenly you have a quantum secured network uh, out in the field somewhere. Or the other place you can do it is um, pipeline monitoring is, is quite valuable information about um, oil and gas or, or other things flowing through, through pipelines um, that has to be encrypted. And so we've been looking at integrating um, some of our systems, starting with a random number generator and some post-quantum algorithms into a, into a pipeline monitoring system. The last one I mentioned this is we went on this um, innovation program with TALIS, which is a, a, French, a French major multinational defense company. They have this innovation program. And you always have a demo day at the end. So not only do we bring our random number generator, you can sort of see an early prototype under Rob's hand here. 
But we also partnered with CryptoNext, a post-quantum algorithms company, um, to show a real use case because we're after showing real use cases with quantum technology. So we piped in randomness from our QRNG. They use that in their post-quantum algorithm because all of these algorithms still need good entropy um, in order to be secure. And the best forms of that is quantum. And then they, they incorporated their algorithms into a, a very po po popular open source um, uh, encryption library called uh, GPG or PGP. Um, and basically at the end of the day, it's hard to show this. Uh, you end up with zeros and ones on the screen, but we did a digital document, a quantum safe digital document signing demo. So basically the task we did is say Talus wanted to buy a million of our devices. Well, they could send us a check digitally. How do we know the check came from them? Well, they can digitally sign it. We do these all, all the time today, um, but we currently use um, algorithms that are insecure against quantum computers. So in this case, we can do it with an algorithm that's now at least conjectured to be quantum safe. And it's using quantum uh, entropy to inject it into this quantum, this quantum safe algorithm. Um, so that Talos could buy a million units and send us a nice big fat check uh, if they wanted. And I'll leave you with this. I think this really is the last slide. I hope I'm not lying for the third time. Um, this is on your doorstep, um, almost, um, in Paris. We are part of the Paris Quantum Communications Infrastructure Initiative. Um, there's this massive European project called QCI that's going to put down a quantum safe network across Europe. And, and France is sort of ahead of the game. They're putting down a four-node network in Paris region that connects up from, I always get this wrong, Je Sieu to Nokia Bell Labs with sort of four nodes. There's sort of 12 consortia partners. Um, CryptoNex is on there. Again, Talis, Nokia, Orange is providing the telecom services. Uh, and sorry, the slides geared towards others uh, where you might be interested is at least a month or two ago, we were still looking for students um, to help out with this system. So if you're interested, there might still be the capacity for joining the project uh, as a master's student or PhD or something like that. Uh, but it's just on your doorstep um, to get a test bed installed and start building quantum safe applications off of it. So I think, uh, I'm not lying, that really is the last one. I mean, I'll just leave you with our vision at CATS. We're trying to, that all the quantum fades to the background. What we're really trying to do is build a world where you can, or you can trust your, your digital connections, your phone, your laptop, just as much as your personal ones. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you very much. That was the part two. So I guess the next step is to would be to go uh, up to Troyes, right? And see that uh, once you go down south of Paris, you can go. We do. Uh, you can go east of Paris, so don't don't forget us. Uh, so. I'm sure all the um, the Champagne vineyards uh, have some proprietary information that they need secure. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And you know you have to check on site as well, uh, not not just by you know, by Fortune. So. Of course. Very very well. Thank you very much. And for this part two, and uh, well, see you next time. Thanks right. very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks.